following is a special presentation of ESPN Classic. Nineteen forty one was a dramatic year in the United States. The big band sounds of Glenn Miller and Benny Goodman were heard throughout the country, creating the era of swing. Goodman also broke racial barriers, hiring black musicians to tour with his orchestra. The film Citizen Kane opened to rave reviews for its director and leading actor, 25-year-old Orson Welles. World War II was in its third year, and the United States prepared for the possibility of being drawn into the conflict. In a long-awaited matchup, Joe Lewis defended his heavyweight boxing title by knocking out Billy Kahn in the 13th round. Joe DiMaggio of the New York Yankees hit on a record 56 consecutive games. And Ted Williams of the Boston Red Sox batted 406, the last man to break 400. If you talk to the old-time sports writers like Red Smith and any of those fellas, there were three sports that everybody went to. One was boxing, and number two, people went to baseball games or horse races. In the spring of 41, there was a racehorse that would win the hearts of race fans throughout the country. Winning his races in dramatic style, he was given the nickname Mr. Longtail. During his career, he became a hero to American soldiers in World War II. His name, Whirlaway. High on the sun-bathed plateaus of central Kentucky, horses graze on the rich bluegrass pastures. This small piece of earth has produced more champion racehorses than any other place in the world. And of all the farms in Kentucky, there is one place that is legendary for the champions it has produced. A farm the racing world knows for its horses that compete in the famed devil red and blue colors. It is a farm called Calumet. With its 850 acres and endless miles of white fences, no other stable has ever won more accolades and trophies, including eight Kentucky Derbies and two Triple Crowns. Of all the great champions Calumet produced, the first to lead this farm to prominence was a chestnut colt born on April 2nd, 1938. His mother was a bay mare named Dust Whirl, and his father, Blenheim II, the winner of the 1930 English Epson Derby. This foal was named Whirlaway. Everyone on the farm called him Whirly. His stable hands reported that he was gentle in his stall, a bit mischievous, and always craving attention. For the first year of his life, he would play and graze on the meadows of Calumet Farm. The dream of its owners, William and Warren Wright. Calumet Farm was founded by William Wright, a self-made millionaire who made his fortune manufacturing baking powder. He was one of the early examples of marketing genius because everything he did to make Calumet baking powder known to the public was an ingenious little scheme. He started out with $3,500 when he rented that space on the west side of Chicago, 400 square feet, and he ended up with a 160,000 square foot factory. It was a product that was considered um, essential in the household. When William retired, he purchased a 407-acre farm located in Lexington, Kentucky. Within five years, he became one of the world's premier breeders of trotters, and in 1931, his ultimate goal was achieved. His horse, Calumet Butler, won the sport's highest honor, the Hamiltonian Stakes, the Kentucky Derby of harness racing. Sadly, William died that morning at the age of 80, without ever knowing his dream had been fulfilled. He left the farm to his son, Warren, who had turned the baking powder business into a company worth over $32 million, which he sold just six months before the 1929 stock market crash. 
Although his father had been one of the top breeders of trotters, the farm was always in debt. To Warren, this was unacceptable. He sold off all of his father's 550 trotters. Warren wanted to strike out on his own and make his own name in a different game than his father had made his name in. And he found in thoroughbred racing a faster paced game played at a much higher financial level than his father was playing. He was driven to succeed when he took over the reins of Calumet baking powder from his father, and he simply transferred that ambition and that that need to compete onto this horse racing Malou out of Lexington. Warren Wright decided to run the farm like he had run his business. He frequently visited the barn, and workers now had to submit daily reports on the progress of his horses. He had two obsessions, to make the farm profitable and to win the greatest race of its day, the Kentucky Derby. Warren Wright had finished fourth in the Kentucky Derby in 1934 with a good filly named Nellie Flagg. It simply whetted his appetite to win the Kentucky Derby, because the closer you get, the more these guys salivate and want to win it. And this was the oldest and most cherished dream of Warren Wright was to win the Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Derby, the premier event of the racing season. The first Saturday in May is always the day reserved for the run for the roses. The mile and a quarter race has been contested since 1875. To win it is the pinnacle of success for horse, jockey, trainer, and owner. You know, you can win all kinds of other races. Uh, maybe races are worth more money. But uh, if you won the Derby, you really got some uh, recognition. It's one of the greatest races of today. The 1938 Derby was run amidst the news that German troops had entered Austria. The prospect of war in Europe seemed more real every day. It was at this Derby that Warren Wright had high hopes for his promising three-year-old, Bo Lee, trained by Frank Kearns. The race was won by Lauren, ridden by 22-year-old jockey Eddie Arcaro. Bo Lee finished a disappointing eighth. After the race, Arcaro gave most of the credit for his victory to Lauren's trainer, Ben Jones. Soon after, Warren Wright fired his trainer. Mr. Wright was a very, very demanding man to work for. If he wasn't happy with somebody, you didn't last long here. He had paid his money, but he was running out of patience. Warren Wright wanted Ben Jones. He saw in Ben Jones a guy that had won the Kentucky Derby. Ben Jones was born in Missouri in 1883, the son of a prominent cattle rancher. He attended Colorado Agricultural College on a football scholarship with his father's expectation that he would return to the farm after graduation. But Ben Jones' first love and devotion was to racehorses. To his father's dismay, he started breeding thoroughbreds on a small scale and raced them in Mexico. The existence was hard and money was scarce. And Ben always said, when I was growing up on my father's ranch outside of Parnell, Missouri, he said, I loved cows and horses. And he said, when I got old enough to start milking the cows, I then decided I wanted to go with the horses. Ben was one of the original horse whisperers. There was something mystical about his connection with horses. You've got to understand that Ben Jones came up the hard way with racing. Money was important but you had to have the ability to use your fists sometimes instead of your mouth and your brain. And he was a brawler. He was a big man with huge hands, and I'm sure he was as handy in a brawl room bar as he was on a lead pony with a stopwatch in his hand. During the Depression, Ben Jones was offered a job training racehorses for Kansas City department store owner Herbert Wolf. It was here at Wolford Farm that Ben Jones trained Lauren, the 1938 Derby winner. That victory caused Warren Wright to call Ben Jones for a meeting. What you understand when you get deeply into Warren Wright and the building of his, all of his empires, he never really got too far from the concept of formulas. And so in his mind, he did not have the one 
thing on the list that he needed, and that was a trainer who had won the Derby. So he lures Ben A. Jones away from Herbert Wolf, doubled his salary, gave him virtually anything he wanted. Ben said, well, I want my son to be my assistant, Jimmy Jones. And Warren said, whatever you want. And suddenly Ben Jones is training for, for Warren Wright. Their first assignment was to assess the yearlings bred at Calumet. To their surprise, it was a poor collection of horses, except for one, whose sire was Blenheim II, a horse Wright had purchased from the Aga Khan as part of a syndicate. This was Jones's first introduction to Whirlaway. In training sessions with Whirlaway, Ben Jones discovered the lone prodigy's quirky talents, amazing speed mixed with complete uncontrollability. And Ben Jones, you know, was hard put to figure out what to do with this beast. He was stubborn, he was goofy, he was uh, unpredictable, uh, erratic, even a bit dangerous. He was a highly nervous horse, and he was so hyper. I don't think anybody could have trained him but Ben Jones. Willoway made his first start on June 3, 1940, at Lincoln Fields Track in Chicago in a race for two-year-olds. To the amazement of the crowd and to the horror of his trainer, he ran most of the race on the outside. But with his amazing speed, he came from behind to win by a nose. This unorthodox style continued throughout the summer. Whirlaway's biggest test came on August 31st on a muddy Saratoga racetrack in the Hopeful Stakes, the premier event for two-year-olds. It was written by Johnny Longdon. By Whirlaway's mid-two-year-old year, he'd already developed his bad habits and had the reputation. Johnny Longdon was as good a jockey as there was, and Whirlaway got the advantage on him. Once he got the advantage, there was no turning back. He goes to the outside rail, runs all the way on the outside rail from the head of the stretch to the wire, and still wins. Tremendous disadvantage. The shortest way home is to be right flat on the inside rail. If you're on the outside rail, instead of running 100 yards, you're running like 250 yards. So everybody knows from that stage of the game that Whirlaway's the real McCoy. And when he won up at Saratoga, it was a huge day. I mean, there was horrible things happening in Europe. The cloud of war was everywhere. And I think one of the sources of this horse's popularity, where people really glommed onto him, was there were so many dark clouds elsewhere. And this horse brought a flash of bright chestnut sunshine into people's lives up in Saratoga and all through New York and wherever he ran. People are looking for a diversion, and I think Whirlaway represented that back in 1940. With this victory, everything was proceeding according to Warren Wright's plan. Not only did he have the trainer, but now he had the horse. Whirlaway would win several more stake races during the fall and finish the racing season as the leading two-year-old money winner of 1940. The following winter, Ben Jones took Whirlaway to Florida to prepare for the 1941 Kentucky Derby. But while in Florida, Warren Wright wanted Whirlaway to run in the Flamingo Stakes at Hialeah. Whirlaway lost some weight in Florida, and also his coat didn't look good, and Ben Jones was concerned. So Ben kind of backed off on him, and again, we're a month away from the premier race of the 1941 Florida season, the Flamingo, and it was important for Warren Wright to be in the social world of Florida. And in those days, Hialeah and the Flamingo were part and parcel of that dance. Ben Jones said, no, we're not going to make the Flamingo. It upset Warren Wright. He was not happy with Ben Jones. But Ben saw a turn, and finally he decided to run the horse, but not in the stake race. He picked a short five and a half furlong sprint at the old Tropical Park racetrack. Didn't tell Warren Wright about it. Warren Wright's down in the Keys, picks up the Miami Herald. Whirl away, sprinting, five and a half furlongs, Tropical Park blows a gasket, gets in the car, races back, gets there right before race time. Ben Jones, what are you doing? I don't want you to run this horse. I want you to scratch. Ben, his back is up now. I'm your trainer, and I'm going to run him. If you don't like it afterwards, you can fire me. 
but I know what's right for this horse. I'm going to do what you're paying me for. Gates open, Whirlaway comes out. It was Whirlaway's day. He did everything right. Two things that day. That proved that Whirlaway could do almost anything, and it made Mr. Wright realize that Ben Jones was the man they'd always been looking for. Warren Wright felt confident that his horse was ready for the Derby. But Ben Jones knew there was one element still missing. Whirlaway was shipped to Lexington to run in the Bluegrass Stakes, scheduled just nine days before the Kentucky Derby. With Wendell Eads riding, he bears out, finishing second to our boots. Ben Jones knew he had the best horse in the race, but felt Eads couldn't control Whirlaway. Four days later in the Derby trial, again, Eads has problems with Whirlaway. He drifts out badly in the home stretch, costing him the race, finishing second to Blue Pair. Wendell Eads had been on him early in his career, and he was thoroughly out of his element. He was small and he was weak and he was inexperienced, and Whirlaway just took advantage of him like a senior in high school would take advantage of somebody that's in kindergarten. Ben Jones knew that he had the horse. What he didn't have was the rider that really satisfied him. And the greatest rider in the East and probably in the United States in those days was Eddie R. Carroll. Ben Jones wanted Eddie R. Carroll to ride Whirlaway, remembering the success they had together with Lauren at the 1938 Derby. But R. Carroll was under contract to Green Tree Stables, owned by John Hay Whitney, and was required to ride their horses in all races they entered. But Green Tree didn't have an entry in this year's Derby. Warren Wright simply called up Whitney and said, can we ride this horse? Well, yes, no problem. And uh, that's the way it worked in those days. I mean, the Blue Bloods took care of each other if their blood wasn't at stake. And John Hay Whitney, don't forget, was one of the shareholders in Blenheim. And so if he could help Warren Wright win the Kentucky Derby with the son of Blenheim, in which he also had a stake, then everybody goes home happy. With Eddie Arcaro now wearing the devil red and blue silks of Calumet, Ben Jones believes that Whirlaway's habit of drifting to the outside can be controlled. At the morning workout, the day before the Derby, Jones asks Arcaro to test his latest theory. Ben takes his lead pony and goes and stands at the head of the stretch, leaving a narrow gap between the inside rail and the pony. And he says to Eddie, he said, now, Eddie, what I want you to do is I want you to take Whirl away, and I want you to come around this turn and bring him between the pony and the rail. Of course, Ben had been experimenting with blinkers, and he had gotten to the point where he had put what we call an extended cup on the outside eye. The theory is a horse will not go where he cannot see. So that blinker cup would shut off the vision to the outside. And Eddie has told the story. He said, well, if that foolish old man is willing to do that, I'll give it a try. It was a hard horse to ride. A lot of everybody couldn't have, could not have ridden that horse. But between Ben Jones and me, we got together, and I, and I listened to them. And it worked. Saturday, May 3rd, 1941, the 67th running of the Kentucky Derby. Socialites politicians, and Hollywood stars are in attendance. A record 100,000 spectators are here to witness the annual Run for the Roses. Whirlaway enters the Derby as the favorite, despite having lost his last two races. Earlier in the week, sports writer Grantland Rice asked Ben Jones about his problematic star. When Whirlaway was coming up to the Kentucky Derby, everybody was just in a tizzy about what's wrong with this horse. Can he control this horse? What's going to happen with this wonderful two-year-old champion? He can't win anything. He's not going to win the Kentucky Derby. The great sports writer, Grantland Rice, came up to Ben Jones and said, Ben, I heard Whirlaway's a half-wit. To which Ben said, well, I don't know if that's so, Granny, but he's making a half-wit out of me. 11 horses are entered in the race. Whirlaway, known as Mr. Longtail by his racing fans, will start from post position four. A lot of people began to notice that when the Calumet horses went to the racetrack in sets, a lot of them had long tails. And Whirlaway had the longest tail of all. But the reason why 
was because Ben Jones believed that horses running with a long tail tended to prevent horses from running up on their rears. Because if a horse is trailing a long tail, the horse behind him is going to avoid it. And he said, God put their tails there for a reason, and I'm leaving them there. Also entered Our Boots, who beat Whirlaway one week earlier in the Bluegrass Stakes, and Blue Pear, who defeated him in the Derby Trial. Eddie Arcaro gets his last set of instructions from Ben Jones. They call me and says, this horse can beat any horse in America, but you've got to ride him like we tell you to ride him, because he only has one run. And if you let him come out of the gate, which he will do if you let him go right with the leaders, you can't make him go a mile and a quarter. So what we'd like to have you do is when the gate opens, stop him. Just stop him, get him left at the gate, and then throw his reins this dangle so you don't grab him by the mouth. And he'll relax. Then you've got him. Once you got him relaxed, let him alone. He'll look all over. He won't know he's running with competition. As they come out of the gate, Dispose takes an early lead, followed by Porter's Cap and Blue Pair. Heading into the first turn, Whirlaway is in the middle of the pack. Our Carol's thinking was that if he kept the horse focused on the rail, he wouldn't run out because he actually thinks he's a parking lot attendant. He doesn't think he's a racehorse. He thinks he belongs in the grandstand eating a hot dog or parking cars. And they're coming down to the half mile pole at the end of the back stretch, and it's still disposed, floating along two and a half lengths in front, with Blue Pair running surprisingly good on the inside. In second place, a half a length in front of Porter's Gap, and he's four lengths in front of Starator, the outsider, with our boots driving hard and failing, dropping back, and Whirlaway is now making his dash in fifth place, and they're rounding the turn, and it is disposed, and Porter's Gap at his head, disposed by half a length. Our Carol was hopelessly beaten going down the backside. He looked like he had no chance. And suddenly, as he went into the far turn, he saw a starter on the outside and our boots on the inside. He takes him inside of starter. So he took a chance. He split two horses. But when he split two horses, Worley kept a straight path. Right there. Worley is coming on the inside. And if he don't get blocked, he'll give him an awful drive. Worley has to leave by half a length. Porter's cap is gone to a drive. No, Whirlaway pulls away. They've got 200 yards to come, and it's Whirlaway by two and a half lengths. Porter's cap is in second place by one half length, and on the inside, pocket wise, coming with a rush. But it's Whirlaway winning the race by six lengths. Whirlaway sets a Kentucky Derby record of two minutes, one and two-fifth seconds, a record that will last 21 years. People love a come-from-behind horse because most people perceive themselves as come-from-behind people. And you can almost hear the cry, and here comes Whirlaway. Boy, that was a sound that would bring people to the edge of their seats. That was an announcement that the show was about to begin. Everybody loved Whirlaway. He had the same kind of an effect as some things that happen in movies. Here he comes. All of a sudden, he's the hero that saves the day, and he races from nowhere and beats everybody. He would absolutely insult other horses as he ran by them. He did it so quickly. Just took all the wind out of their sails. Ben Jones had his derby. Warren Wright had his derby. Warren Wright hosts a star-studded gala that evening, celebrating his long-awaited victory. But Ben Jones focuses on Whirlaway's next test, the Preakness at Pimlico Racetrack in Baltimore, Maryland, just one week away. Ben Jones wastes no time in shipping Whirlaway by rail the 600 miles to Baltimore, Maryland for the Preakness. Only one week separates the two races. When Whirlaway arrives, Jones has only three days to prepare him for the race. The Preakness is run at a mile and three sixteenths, a sixteenth of a mile shorter than the Kentucky Derby. Because Pimlico is noted for its sharp turns, 
Ben Jones is especially worried Whirlaway will drift out and lose ground in the stretch. May 10th, 1941, the 51st running of the Preakness. Whirlaway will start along the rail in post position one. There they go. At least there goes seven of them. Whirlaway walks out of the gate, counting the house. King Cole out in front, disposed second. Curious coin, a length and a half to the good of Kansas. Then Ocean Blue, quarters cap. Whirlaway, our hero, running eighth and last. And no doubt giving his strong supporters the miseries. It's jockey Eddie R. Carroll once again aboard the Derby champ and evidently holding him under restraint. They hope. In the turn now, King Cole ably holding his lead with his challengers at his heels. That is all but the Derby winner, Whirlaway. Little Long Tail is eating the dust. In fact, the champ right now is all but out of the picture. Doggone it, he is out. How do you like that? He got back there last. I didn't like it. I said, man, I can't stand this any longer. He must have been 10 lengths in back of the last horse. King Cole, meanwhile, still leading the parade down the far side and running at the delicious odds of 25 to 1. I had about five eighths of a mile yet to go. I just started getting the reins together and tightening up on him. When I was tightening up on him, he started fighting me. He wanted to go, which is what I needed. So then I could move him up and get him in position to when I dropped him down, he would fire. Whirl away, returns to the picture. Jockey R. Carroll takes him wide for racing room, then calls on the coat for all he's got. Look at him come. Whirl away, moving up, coming fast, traveling wide open. It's another derby climax. But they travel a mile and 3 16th today. That's a quarter more than the bluegrass run. So it's now the heartthrob. Can he last? Can he last? Look at him go. Whirl away, now running fourth. He's third. He's second. He's closing on King Cole. He looks him in the eye, and Whirlaway is out in front. They're in the stretch turn. Whirlaway is pouring it on, pulling away. Another blazing finish as the little red colt shows his heels. And with that tail waved bye-bye to them all. When he made his move away saying, here comes Whirl Away or Mr. Longtail or Broomtail, and it was a fabulous something that just thrilled you all the way through. You didn't need a program to, to watch uh, Whirl Away. You could just see that tail. And uh, he was quite a thing to look at. I guess if it had been any other horse with lesser ability than Whirl Away, the start would have been the end. But as Arcaro said, he was one running horse. And once he got himself in gear, there was no holding him back. He just was a super horse. And so Whirlaway was running for the Triple Crown, and actually Warren Wright was quoted after the Preakness in the New York Times as saying, now we're on, we're going for the Triple Crown. The Triple Crown title was not associated with American horse racing until 1930, when sports writer Charles Hatton of the Daily Racing Forum coined the phrase while writing about Gallant Fox's victories in the three races the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont Stakes. There had been an English Triple Crown for years, generations. America, Charlie said, needed a Triple Crown, like England. Charlie started writing about those three races as the American Triple Crown. Gradually, the American was dropped off of it, but that's how it evolved. Though Gallant Fox was the first horse to be proclaimed the winner of the American Triple Crown, he was not the first to do it. Eleven years earlier, in 1919, Sir Barton won the same three races, making him the first Triple Crown champion. June 7, 1941, the Belmont Stakes, the final leg of the Triple Crown for Whirlaway. A lot of stuff happened the week of the Belmont. On the Monday before the Belmont, Lou Gehrig died. Big funeral, the papers were just filled with it. The day after Lou Gehrig died, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who had left Europe after his armies collapsed in 1918, died in exile. The war was raging even hotter in Europe. The newspapers are re reflecting trouble we're having negotiating with the Japanese. England's getting pounded. 
America's not yet officially in the war, but we're sending all sorts of supplies over. The U-boats are sinking things in the North Atlantic. You know, the world is collapsing. And suddenly, here's this star emerges in America, and thousands and thousands of people show up at Belmont Park. And had there been television, Old Worley would have commanded the spotlight that day also. The Belmont Stakes is called the Test of Champions. At a mile and a half, it challenges the strength and endurance of a three-year-old. Because Whirlaway dominated the first two races, only three other horses entered the Belmont. The rival trainers devised a plan to defeat Whirlaway. Their jockeys would set a slow pace, saving their horses' energy for a burst of speed to match Whirlaway's at the finish. Kentucky Derby and Preakness winner going to the post and odds on favorite at one to four in a four horse race. All in good line now and they're off. It's Havel first away, then Yankee Chance. Whirl away under the restraining hand of jockey Eddie R. Carroll running third. And there he stays. Eddie R. Carroll, brilliant rider, knew that they were slowing the pace down on him. In a mile and a half race, if you can slow the pace down and the front runner gets an easy go of it, and when he turns for home, if he has anything left, he might be very hard to catch. Our Carroll was a master of pace. He had a clock in his head. And as they were going down the backstretch, he said, I kind of knew that nobody was going to go out and set the pace. Our Carroll said, I kind of talked it over with Wardway. And we kind of decided we better move. Well, our Carroll decides that the pace is too slow, gives Whirlaway three bells, and the gig is up. Well, this, you know, is the third and final episode of America's annual racing triple. Whirlaway now joins the exalted ranks of Sir Barton, Gallant Fox, Omaha, and War Admiral as big shot number five to take the classical triple crown. The acclaim accorded Whirlaway after his Triple Crown victories was all but unanimous. Rival owners, jockeys, and sports writers alike sang his praises. Charles Howard, the owner of Seabiscuit, said, there isn't a horse anywhere in the country that could have beaten Whirlaway. Jockey George Wolfe proclaimed, his victory in the Preakness was the most incredible performance I have ever seen in my many years. 10 lengths behind, and he wins. He is a thoroughbred genius with a phenomenal burst of speed. And Arthur Daly of the New York Times wrote, his races were a spectacular show of strength, speed, and stamina. When Whirlaway came into focus with his long tail flying, it was magic. He made the others in the race appear to be standing still. It was the ordinary person that made these horses what they were, because they wanted to see them. They wanted to be there. They wanted to be able to tell somebody 10 years from now, I saw Whirlaway win the Kentucky Derby. I followed him to Baltimore and to New York at Belmont Park to see him win the Triple Crown. I was there. I was part of it. Having won the Triple Crown, Wright wanted to ensure Whirlaway's legacy. He now set his sights on breaking the great Seabiscuit's old-time money-winning mark. In those days, winning the money title was very important. Money was on everybody's mind because nobody had any. And boy, people were counting nickels and dimes and pennies, and Hero Horse is coming along winning close to $500,000. That was a staggering amount of money in those days, staggering. Whirlaway completed the 1941 racing season with six more victories, including the Traverse Stakes at Saratoga, a race sometimes referred to as the fourth leg of the Triple Crown. To this date, he is the only horse ever to have won all four races. In early October, Warren Wright entered Whirlaway in the $100,000 Santa Anita Handicap set for March 7, 1942. Winning this one race would make Whirlaway the richest money winner in racing history. In late October, Warren Wright sent Whirlaway and Ben Jones to California to train for this momentous event. December 7th, 1941. The American naval base at Pearl Harbor is attacked by the Japanese. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt speaks to the nation. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. 
the United States has entered the war. American males are drafted into the armed forces. Women replace men in the factories, now reconfigured to produce armaments. Following a Japanese submarine attack on an oil refinery in Santa Barbara, California, Japanese American citizens are placed in internment camps. All horse racing is suspended on the West Coast. They close all the racetracks and uh, of course you had to take your horses back to the farm and employees, a lot of them went to the, to the service and uh, it was really a dark day in racing. World away was at Santa Anita when the war broke out. I was there myself and we all left about a week later. They'd closed and then they made an intern camp out of Santa Anita. Whirlaway's goal of becoming the richest money winner is put on hold. He is shipped back to Calumet Farm in March to await his future. The United States Armed Forces were concerned with the morale of soldiers at its military installations and on the battlefronts. The USO began raising funds to support service clubs and camp shows to entertain its military personnel. From America to all our men in blue, our boys in khaki too, our tough Marines, our Coast Guard, our Army nurses true. We thank you so much. The Thoroughbred Racing Association of the United States saw this as an opportunity to keep racing alive and to support the nation in a time of war. A plan was devised to raise money for the war effort. To supply our men in battle with everything they need and buying and holding war bonds. These are things that we at home must do to speed victory. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, was trying to raise as much money as quickly as he possibly could. Roosevelt would call people and would say to them, look, you know, we need you to run your horses to promote horse racing and say something about buying bonds. And uh, people like Warren Wright, um, they used their horses for the United States government as vehicles to sell bonds. Racetracks throughout the country sold war bonds for special races, with the proceeds going to the war relief effort. The initial goal was to raise $2 million for the USO. Whirlaway immediately became the most sought after racehorse to see. In the 1942 racing season, Whirlaway ran in 22 races at 12 different tracks. The human stars of the game were away fighting the war, and the people at home needed Horses like Whirlaway as heroes. I mean, those were really tough times for, particularly in the early years of the wars, 42 and 43, where it looked like we might not win. And we had taken a beating every place. The Japanese had run us out of Asia, out of the Pacific. The English were on their heels in North Africa. And horses like Whirlaway brought something to America that, hey, look at this horse. He doesn't know we're in war, but he's in the game anyway. And he's helping everybody. He's helping the war effort. And it was something that we saw in America probably for the last time, is that, uh, that everybody came together. And Whirlaway was certainly part of it, because he was the star of the game in 42. They would buy the bonds to see him run. He sold more war bonds than all the stars put together. Just going from track to track, people would go. And I know when I was in the service, that's all you heard about, was he? Because he helped sponsor all the USOs. I believe there was even one of the bombers that had Whirlaway on it. Him and his owner done a fabulous job for, for this country at that time. Over a half million fans came to see Whirlaway compete in 1942, raising almost $5 million for the War Relief Fund. Averaging almost a race a week, Ben Jones would later call him the strongest horse he ever trained. As a four-year-old, he's running in the early part of the year and through the summer in what we call handicaps. Well, Whirlaway carried anywhere from at a minimum of 12 more pounds to a maximum, I think, of like 23 or 24 pounds more than most of the horses in the race, and he still was successful. Whirlaway would pay a price for carrying the extra weight and his rigorous schedule. On September 19th, Whirlaway and Al the 1942 winner of the Preakness, meet in a match race at Narragansett Racetrack. With Eddie Arcaro under suspension, Whirlaway is ridden by George Wolfe, the jockey who had guided Seabiscuit to victory over War Admiral in their 1938 match race. 
the real centerpiece of his four-year-old campaign was this uh, remarkable run he had with Al Sab. Al Sab turns for home, two in front. Worloway tries to move up on him. Al Sab pulls away, and the place is going crazy. They thought, well, Worloway's going to pull away from him. And then, no, Al Sab comes back. And then Worloway pulls up again. Al Sab comes back. And these two horses are ding dong in it, hammer and tongs. And they hit the wire as one. It was very difficult to separate them. And they showed the photo, they have sudden dejection because the great champion had lost by this much. Despite the loss to Alsab, Whirlaway would go on to win five more races, increasing his total winnings to more than $560,000, far surpassing Seabiscuit. He is named Horse of the Year for a second time. Entering his five-year-old season, it was expected Whirlaway would add more honors to his already illustrious career. On June 22, 1943, at Washington Park, Chicago, Whirlaway finished fifth in a field of 12, the worst finish since his two-year-old campaign. What was most disturbing was that Whirlaway pulled up lame. The diagnosis was a bowed tendon. Later that day, a saddened Ben Jones announced that Whirlaway would never race again. Ben Jones, you might say that he had an affection for Whirlaway that may have been as strong or stronger than any of his other horses because he was like a father with a kid that was tough to handle, but he loved him just as much. The single most remarkable thing about Whirlaway was that from September the 28th of his two-year-old year until June the 22nd of 1943. He ran 60 times and he was four times out of the money. But twice he was fourth and twice he was fifth. The one time he was fifth at the end of his career, that was when he broke down again. He never raced again. It was an unbelievable record that this horse rung up. And what a durable horse. Never missed a dance. In those days, that was also part and parcel of the good ones. And the one thing that is very interesting about Whirlaway is he seemed to win the important ones. On July 13th, 1943, Whirlaway returned to Calumet to begin his retirement. Thousands of people in Lexington lined the roads to greet him. He had come home to the bluegrass fields of Kentucky. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. Thousands of soldiers lost their lives fighting for the liberation of Europe from the oppression of the Nazi regime. Eleven months later, Germany surrendered. As a memorial, the 2,500 soldiers who gave their lives on D-Day were buried above the beaches of Normandy. On August 14, 1945, VJ Day was declared. The Japanese had surrendered. World War II was over. For the rest of the 1940s, Warren Wright and Ben Jones created a dynasty in horse racing, the most successful owner-trainer partnership in history. And they, along with Eddie Arcaro, accomplished a feat that is yet to be duplicated. On June 12, 1948, Calumet Farm's Citation won the Belmont Stakes, becoming the eighth Triple Crown winner. No other owner-trainer-jockey combination has ever won the Triple Crown twice. Warren Wright had found the combination, and then it was just one right after another. It was Whirl Away, then Pensive, then Citation, then Ponder. By the time Warren Wright died, he had had four Kentucky Derby winners and two Triple Crown winners. The real significance of a horse like Whirlaway is he was the first. He was the first to carry the devil's red and blue colors to victory and to immortality with Whirlaway. I was riding the best horses, like the Citations, the Whirlaways, and, and man, that could make you good. <laughs> that made me good, I know that. Thoroughbred racing in Europe had been decimated by the war. The racing breed stock needed to be restored. 
French horse racing owner Marcel Boussac came to America and Calumet Farms, hoping to find a stallion. And Marcel Boussac saw Whirlaway physically. He had filled out by them. He went, ah, he said in French, that's for me. In July of 1950, Whirlaway was shipped to Marcel Boussac's stable in Normandy, France, where he would sire a new generation of horses in Europe. Three years later, at the age of 15, Whirlaway died of a heart attack. I think the final and most poignant touch is when Whirlaway died and Whirlaway had done his share to raise money uh, to fund the war. When he was shipped over to France, it happened that Boussac's farm was in Normandy. And so he is buried not far from the beaches where the soldiers had died, landing in, uh, in June of 1944. That was a nice gesture for him to bury up there. I bet a lot of soldiers went by him and, and paid their respects, you know. He was a fabulous horse. This horse just never got the credit that the horse should have got. You know, occasionally, the way the fates play with history, you will get a confluence of events and an orchestration of people that just create a moment that becomes magical. And that's the way it was with Whirlaway. Warren Wright's relentless pursuit of the Kentucky Derby, which eventually led to the relentless pursuit of the Triple Crown. His decision to turn the stable around by hiring Ben Jones. Ben Jones's decision to replace a lovely little jockey with a great rider named Eddie R. Carroll. And it was a situation in which, like many times in history, Jupiter aligned with Mars and all of the tumblers clicked and the safe opened and out walked whirl away and we had a moment in history which was magical and will never be repeated.